You're listening to Qalam Institute's podcast. Visit us on the web at qalaminstitute.org and join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash qalaminstitute. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah from today we'll be starting a series on the seerah, the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To get started today, insha'Allah, what I wanted to talk about is, as this is the tradition of scholars throughout the centuries from the past, that whenever they begin a topic, they begin a subject, any type of a study, uh, or any area of study, they always begin by providing somewhat of an introduction. What is this science? What is this study? And what are some of the basic things or the basic principles that need to be kept in mind when approaching this area of study? So we're approaching the study of the seerah, the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the very first thing that we have to understand is what is seerah? What does seerah even mean? What does it even refer to? Because a lot of times we can become so used to, we can become so comfortable with certain terminologies that we don't realize actually what it means or what it refers to. So seerah itself, the word seerah in the Arabic language linguistically, it literally means a path. It means a path where somebody walks, a direction which somebody takes. So to walk in a particular direction is seerah. That's why masir is walking, all right? Or a path on which people walk, like a sidewalk, a pathway. And so that's literally what seerah means. Now, it's used more figuratively in the meaning of referring to a person's life. A seerah refers to a person's life, the path somebody has walked, the path that someone has traversed. So a path that somebody has gone uh, it lived life in a direction of and and it's used oftentimes as a description as well like they would say in arabic fulanun lahu siratun hasana that such and such person he has a very beautiful life he has a very excellent way of living life and it's used in its linguistic meaning in the quran as well in surah taha Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 21 from surah number 20 surah taha Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when talking to Musa alayhi salam, remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Musa alayhi salam, what's in your hand? Wa ma tilka bi aminika ya Musa, what's in your right hand, O Musa? And he said, hiya asaya, it's my staff, it's my stick, my walking stick. And then he went on to describe it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him, he said, alqiha ya Musa, throw it down, let it go, O Musa. Fa fa idha hiya hayatun tasa'a, he dropped it and it became, it became a rapidly moving snake or serpent. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him, Khudha, take it, grab it, wala takhaf, and don't be afraid. Samu'iduha sirata hal ula. We very soon will re- return it to sirat. The word Allah uses is sira, sirat. We will return it back to its first sira, its first form, the first way, the shape that it was. So literally, your condition. The way you are, the way you live life, even your physical form is a part of your seerah, is a part of a person's seerah. So that's the linguistic meaning of the word seerah. So seerah doesn't just mean a way a person lives or a way a person talks or walks. It includes those things, but even the way a person looks, the way a person acts, in all facets and aspects of that person's life, that is all inclusive of that person's seerah. Alright, so that's the literal, the linguistic meaning of the word seerah. Now, in terms of more technical terminology, what does the word seerah refer to? What does, it, what, what does it mean? So again, the word seerah very interestingly is a literary term. It's a literary term. It's an istalah, it's a mustalah adabi. It's a literary term. So like what we call biography, literally translates to seerah. The word seerah means biography. And there is seerah shakhsiya. That's a biography of someone. The biography of a person is called Sira Shaksiya. But there are also, like in English, we know we have autobiographies. That in Arabic is called Sira Dhatiya. A Sira to Dhatiya is an autobiography. So it's a literary term, the word Sira. Now you bring it down more, and so there's literally, you know, there, you, there's every type of Sira that you can imagine. All right, as many types of biographies there are, there are similarly that many types of sira as well. So, but specifically what we're here to talk about is a sira to nabawiya, the prophetic biography. And so what we're talking about is a sira to nabawiya, the prophetic biography. 
Now, when talking about the prophetic biography, what does that refer to? What does that allude to? What does that include? What does that encompass? So the Sirat al-Nabawiyah, as described by the, prof, by, by the scholars, as defined by them, is that it is مَجْمُعُ مَا وَرَدَ لَنَا مِنْ وَقَائِعِ حَيَاتِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ وَصِفَاتِهِ الْخُلْقِيَّةِ وَالْخَلْقِيَّةِ مُضَافًا إِلَيْهَا غَزَوَاتُهُ وَسَرَايَاهُ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ That the seerah is everything, all of that which has come to us which has been related to us from all of the occurrences of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Anything and everything that occurred related to, in regards to, or directly in connection to the life and times of the Prophet ﷺ. Some of the previous scholars would refer to seerah, would define the seerah by saying, min sunanihi wa ayyamihi. From his sunan, from his practice, and from his days. Meaning, every single day of his life is a part of his seerah. So all of that would be included within the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. And all of his attributes, all of his characteristics, whether they be khulqiyah or khalqiyah, meaning his physical descriptions are a part of his seerah. His physical descriptions are a part of his seerah, but his mannerisms are also a part of his seerah. All of his campaigns, his expeditions, his military endeavors, his family life, his home life, everything is included within the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. And sometimes when you look back at very early compilations or uh, references of the seerah, they would oftentimes be referred to as al-maghazi or al-ghazaya, like the kitab al-maghazi of Imam Bukhari. So Imam Bukhari talks about the life of the Prophet ﷺ by referencing it as kitab al-maghazi the book of the different military campaigns or expeditions of the Prophet ﷺ, and a lot of the seerah would be included therein. Or you would have um, books like the Al-Ghazaya of Al-Waqidi, a very, very early scholar by the name of Al-Waqidi. He had a book or he had a collection of the references of the life of the Prophet ﷺ under the title of Al-Ghazaya, which is a plural of Ghazwa, which are the military expeditions. Why that is, I'll explain a little bit later on, inshallah, when talking a little bit about the early books of Sirah and the focus of Sirah that has existed within the Ummah Muslimah throughout the generations. Now, the next thing that I wanted to talk about which is very, I, I think it's of the utmost importance, is why study seerah. That's very, very important. So after scholars would talk about the definition of seerah, then what is the, what is the technical understanding of what is seerah? Then they would talk about what is the mawdu' of the seerah, meaning what is the subject matter of the seerah, and that is self-explanatory. As seerah to Nabawiyah, it's the study of the Prophet wasallam. But now we reach the, reach the crucial, critical question of why study seerah? Why study seerah? And I present this question with a few basic, um, if you will, preconceived notions in mind. All right? Seerah is something that has been the subject of study since the very first day. The study of seerah goes hand in hand with the study of the book of Allah, the study of the Quran. So it's been around from day one. And most of everybody here listening, watching, or listening to this later has probably come across seerah in some capacity or another throughout their life. But I'm going to go ahead and present some of the preconceived notions we might have of seerah. Or some of the history that you might have of studying seerah in your own past. It has been presented to you in the form of various books, textbooks even. From early as Sunday school, or what our children go through in terms of Sunday school, coming up through maybe some of the stuff that was instituted as part of the Islamiyat, as, uh, at some level of school education, um, or maybe you came, came across it later on as an adult, study, studying some type of a text, or some type of a manual that was written on the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and that usually has unfortunately manifested itself in a couple of different unfortunate ways. Either, number one, it's been a very dry study, of just names, places, dates. Basically a collection of facts is what it's been. Year number this, place number this, person number so and so, person such and such, and this incident happened. And then move on. So it's a very dry study of facts, names, and places. Alright, almost like a timeline. 
or it's been presented in a way, in a fashion, where maybe it's been told in a story format, which is one thing that's very important, very necessary. Classical scholars, and I'll be elaborating on this a little bit later, but classical scholars, traditional study of the seerah was done in a way, in a fashion that was a very flowing narrative. Just like Qur'an for us, unfortunately for a lot of us, was the only way we knew Qur'an was either pure recitation on its own, or pure rote memorization on its own, or at the most, those of us who were fortunate enough, we knew Qur'an as a translation. Which again left you wanting more, left you desiring something more. But similarly, seerah, for a lot of people who were fortunate enough to have some interaction with the seerah, again, it, was, it had some form of narrative to it, which was a blessing. But then it doesn't change the fact that that narrative was all that it was, it was a narrative. So it almost became relegated to being a, uh, almost like a telling of a story, like a fairy tale. A long, long time ago in a faraway place, a person named such and such did this. Or that happened with them. It was no different than a fairy tale. A fairy tale is exactly that what it is. And this is what I always tell people whenever I lecture on the seerah in any way, shape or form. I always almost begin by saying there's two unfortunate trends of seerah or understandings of seerah within our community today. One is that name, place, date that just, it's like a Wikipedia page. It's just factual information. Or the second thing is, it's a, it's a nice story. It's a narrative that at least grips your attention for the time being. But it ends up being, like I said, something that happened with somebody that I have no connection to a long time ago in a faraway place. Meaning, what am I supposed to do with that? I was captivated for 30 minutes, I was captivated for 45 minutes, but what do I do after that? It's entertainment, basically. So we either have facts or we have entertainment. But the, the purpose of the seerah, like anything else, was that what is the benefit that I can take home from this? So it's, the facts are very important. Without the facts, we just have a story. We just have a fairy tale. The facts are very important. But then the narrative, the flowing narrative is important because not all of us are scientists. Not all of us are advanced students of knowledge or scholars that we're going to be invigorated and we will be refreshed and we'll be rejuvenated and energized by simply knowing the facts and the, 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 the pure data. We're not all of us can read code basically. So when I pull up code of, uh, of some type of coding in terms of a website or something, all I see is mumbo jumbo. It doesn't make any sense to me. A programmer is, wow, that's amazing. Right, a programmer looks at that and it's, it's one man's trash is another man's treasure, right? So he looks at it and he goes, oh my God, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I say, I don't know what you're talking about, right? So, so for some people, the facts might work, but that typically involves being a very advanced student of knowledge, some, a scholar, right? That they get blown away when they read like, oh wow, that really happened in this year, subhanAllah, right? That that works for them. Or somebody, or if we remove the narrative, it's just a dry information. We remove the dry information, it's just a narrative. It's just a fairy tale. We need those two things, but we need the third critical component. And that is the practicality and the relevance. How can I apply this to my life? What lessons can I learn from this? What can I take home from this? And that combined together is how we will try to approach the seerah. <clears throat> So I was saying that we need to now talk about the critical issue of why study the seerah. So that gets out of the way how seerah might have been presented to you in the past. And what I'm going to be asking you to do is put aside those, the, any type of preconceived notions you have, any baggage you might have, any reservations you might have about seerah. Like I've been there, done that brother. You know, I've been there, done that. Like when you hear a tafsir lecture, the, one of the first things you have to do is, yes, you read the translation of the surah, but don't let that hold you back from benefiting from what you're about to get right now, because this is at a whole nother level. And that's what we're basically going to make an attempt, what we're going to try to do with the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the seerah. So now going to why study the seerah, I have a few basic points. Number one, when we look in the Qur'an as well, all right, and I'm going to make the connection with the seerah with the Qur'an. But let's go ahead and start right at the top. When we look at the book of Allah, the Qur'an, the instruction from Allah. Very beginning, the, the beginning of guidance, the book of Allah, the Qur'an. When you look there and when you, when you observe the ayat, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns our attention towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to go and study the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And at the center of that, the epitome of that, is of course in Surah Al-Hazab, Surah number 33, ayah number 21, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, لقد, uh, or rather, excuse me, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا 
Surah number 33, Ayah 21, Allah tells us, لَقَدْ the, the, the ayah begins with two levels of two levels of emphasis. The lam is for emphasis. The qad is for emphasis. All right. So most definitely, there is no doubt about the fact. Kana lakum fi Rasulillah. This kana could grammatically. You could grammatically make the argument that kana is unnecessary. You could you could deliver the same basic meaning without without this extra verb of kana. But the kana has a purpose, and the purpose of the kana is that. There are two things. One is emphasis, but it's not just that simple or that easy. Number two is, it gives the meaning of al-istimrar, which means that it persists. It, it creates the meaning of this, whatever this lesson is being given, whatever message is being conveyed, this message is eternal, is universal, is continuous, is consistent. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that most definitely there is no doubt about the fact that consistently, without any exception, for all times, fi Rasulillahi uswatun hasana, that there is exclusively for you, fi Rasulillah in the Messenger of Allah, the mo- the ultimate example, the ultimate example, the perfect role model, the most excellent role model. So when you look at the construction of the ayah, there is emphasis and exclusivity built into this ayah. The, the way the grammar is laid out, that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is saying, there's no doubt. Make no mistake, no doubt about the fact that within the, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa there is for all of you, for all times, the ultimate, the most excellent role model. And that is the only excellent role model that you will find. There is no role model better than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Now what's interesting, what I want to focus on within the, this ayah and the language of this ayah is the word fi. Allah says fi Rasulillah, in the Messenger of Allah. In the Messenger of Allah. And that word fi has certain implications. There are certain rhetorical implications, benefits of the word fi inside of, in the Messenger of Allah. That basically what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us is that you will only, the Prophet will only be the ultimate role model for you. He will only be an amazing role model and an exemplar for you when and only when you completely immerse yourself into the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. In the Messenger of Allah, meaning you have to immerse yourself into the life of the Messenger ﷺ. You have to put yourselves in the shoes of the Prophet ﷺ. You have to try to live the life of the Prophet ﷺ. As he lived it day by day, event by event, occurrence by occurrence. You have to live that life, you have to walk through the, that life. You have to try to walk in those shoes. At least conceptually, at least try to imagine what that was like. And take a journey through his life. Then only then will you realize how much of an amazing example the Prophet ﷺ can be for you. And so that's why when we, and this is something I'm going to get to later, but when we kind of do a synopsis of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, we take a lesson here, we take a lesson there, or we take a look at a few ahadith, or we take a look at a few different collections of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, that's one thing. But to, comp- to truly understand the experience of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and then to be able to realize how I can benefit from that and what I can learn from that, the first thing is you have to have an immersing experience. You have to live that life. You have to experience that. You have to have a full understanding and appreciation for what that life was like. That's the first thing. So that's why a study of the seerah in depth you know, stage by stage, day by day, blow by blow, that's why it's so important, is that it will give you that full impact, that full experience, and that full understanding, at least at some level. So that's the first thing. That's why we study seerah, and how we're going to approach the seerah. The second thing is, studying the seerah, when you just know certain facts about the Prophet ﷺ, again, like I said, it becomes something that is just factual information. When you have a narrative, it's that fairy tale. When you even have a hadith, it again becomes something very technical. Very technical. This is how you know he prayed. This is how what the sunnah of doing this is. This is what the sunnah of doing that is. That's beneficial. But it is technical. What we're in need of more than ever before is to humanize the Prophet ﷺ. You know the common average Muslim, and this is true. This is something I haven't done like a formal survey. I don't have statistics for you. But something that... I've been doing for years. People from all walks of life, men and women, old and young, especially youth and children. It's a bigger problem with youth than it is any other demographic. 
And even converts and reverts, especially with converts and reverts, and especially youth. And that means that those are many times the demographics within our community who are still new, they're still young, meaning they're fresh. They're being molded, they're still learning, they're still absorbing. And a lot of times they end up absorbing a lot about the religion, about deen, about Islam and Quran and about the Messenger Wasallam. what we already have existent within our community. You find this within the demographics. When you ask them about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi they they don't feel like they have a lot in common. They don't feel that he even... Sometimes their impression of the Prophet Wasallam is not even that of being a human being. And, and with the, with the pr- proliferation of comic books, superheroes, and you know, uh, all this type of like, you know, um, uh, this type of mythology and lore that we have in our communities, like Superman and Batman and Spider-Man and all this, you know, this is something that's very prevalent in our communities. So it's become very common for somebody to just go ahead and reconcile or understand that somebody is superior to them. They can't ever be, like Superman was from outer space. He was from Krypton. No human being could ever be like Superman. It was just understood. Spider-Man got bit by a radioactive spider. That's it. Nobody else is going to be Spider-Man. Spider-Man is Spider-Man. That's it. All right? It's something that our youth are very comfortable with. I know it sounds silly to adults, but understand, when you're you're four years old and you start watching Superman and Spider-Man, it, it, it becomes ingrained within your mind, within your psyche. And it's, it becomes very easy to reconcile. So when we present Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a very non-human fashion, in a very non-human fashion, understand that a lot of times our youth end up walking away with the same image of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as they have of Superman. He was a man from another planet altogether, like he had nothing to do with us. We have nothing in common with him. Well, yeah, he was that awesome. And yeah, he would talk to people like this. And he was this charitable. And he was that amazing. Because of course, he was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Of course he was that awesome. Like, I know Superman flies. Of course he does. Because he's Superman. But you can't expect me to fly because I'm an earthling. I can't fly. Same way they feel like they have nothing in common with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa at all. And while, and see, we confuse two issues. Should there be respect for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Of course. Should there be reverence for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Obviously. But he should not become so distant to us where now we feel no connection. We feel no relationship at all. I don't see him as a role model for me. I just see him as somebody that I should read about, that I should go ooh and ah when I hear about him or I read about him and that's it. That's the problem. And that's the problem that exists. But when you study the seerah, the life of the Prophet ﷺ, that's the number one thing. That it humanizes him. When you study his life, how he lived, and day by day, everything that was going on with him, how he was emotionally, how this day was difficult for him, and how emotionally this day he experienced joy and happiness, how he had a wife and a family, how he suffered injury, how he suffered loss. When you study the seerah, it humanizes the Prophet ﷺ. And that's very, very important. And that's one of the key differences, and I'll just drop it in here almost as a tangent. But there are a few terminologies that we, again, uh, that we confuse. And they have a certain amount of overlap, but nevertheless, they refer to different things. One terminology within Islam is hadith. Hadith is a terminology. Hadith refers to actual narrations and traditions of the Prophet ﷺ. His life, it includes what he said, what he did, what he approved of. Those are narrations about him. Hadith are primarily something very technical. It's something very technical. It's, it's quotations from his life, excerpts from his life. And a lot of times a hadith will be presented to you without the context of that hadith. And, there's no, and that's not a bad thing. It's meant to be done because it's a technical tool. It's a resource. Hadith is something that the muhaddithun, they, they qualify. They verify. All right? And then the fuqaha, the jurists, the Islamic legal experts, they take and then they extrapolate rulings from there. They derive and extract rulings from there. Now based on this hadith, what can we eat and what can we not eat? What can we wear? What can we not wear? How should we pray and how should we not pray? 
What breaks your wudu and what does not break your wudu. They bring those legalities, those technicalities from there. So hadith has a role. What we've done though is a lot of times, and this goes for majority of our communities, our only interaction with the life of the Prophet ﷺ are those technical ahadith. Some of the ahadith will relate to, do refer to some of his mannerisms and the way he spoke and talked. But again, it's an excerpt. It's just taken from there. But it's not a part of that overall narrative. Which again can sometimes dehumanize. Alright? So hadith has its role. It's very important. But it should never exclusively be studied absent of the seerah of the Prophet And I would even go as far as saying, and this might sound controversial to someone, everybody needs to be aware, be familiar with the hadith of the Prophet But if you were, I don't think that we should ever make exclusive, we should never make exclusions. Oh, only study the Qur'an. Don't say, no, I, I don't think we should ever make exclusions. The healthy Muslim is the one who has an element of every study of deen within his life. He has a basic understanding and a basic learning of fiqh from a scholar. Otherwise, you wouldn't even know how to make wudu properly if you never studied fiqh at any level. I know we get emotional sometimes and we say things like, Oh, you don't even know Qur'an, why should you even study fiqh? Don't study fiqh, study Qur'an. Like, no, no, no. You need to reevaluate yourself. That if all you do is obsess over fiqh and you don't even know basics of the Qur'an, then you have a problem. You have an imbalance you need to correct. But if you, all you did was study Qur'an and you never even took basic level fiqh from a scholar, from a proper source, you wouldn't even know how to make wudu properly. You wouldn't even know what broke your wudu. You wouldn't know. So a healthy Muslim is the one who has a healthy dose of every field of study. He has basic fiqh, basic sirah, basic hadith, basic Qur'an. And he's taking all of this and he continues to grow and graduate to different levels within these areas of study. But if, for the purposes of practicality, if a Muslim had to make a preference of whether I should indulge within studying hadith or sirah, when we look throughout the tradition of education, uh, uh, throughout the generations of our ummah, and how scholarship has handled that issue. You will see that preference was always given to seerah. Because within the, had, within the study of hadith, it wasn't studied traditionally the way we approach it a lot of times today. Again, the Qur'an wasn't studied the way we approach it today. Qur'an, translation, boom. That's how we move on, right? That's not how Qur'an was studied. They would study it. They would understand it. They would go into the depth of it. Similarly, when they would study hadith, they would, it was in depth. They would study it very, very much in depth. I mean, Imam Bukhari, pretty much the, the, the epitome of his life's work is Sahih al-Bukhari, which is, I believe, 6,000 some odd narrations. I mean, I want you to think about man's, and not just some ordinary man, Imam Bukhari's life's work is 6,000 hadith. That's very little. But that's how in depth they would approach the study of hadith. But in reality, the study of seerah was something that is, is, was universally studied. It was something that was meant for all demographics of the Muslim community. Regardless of what your access to scholarship was, seerah was something that was studied. So that's the, one, the difference between hadith and seerah. And then secondly, there's, there, thirdly, there's a terminology by the name of sunnah. Now sunnah is a very subjective word. Sunnah is a very flexible word. It's a word that has almost a different meaning based on the context in which you use it. The word sunnah varies. Sunnah overall includes everything. The seerah of the Prophet ﷺ is a part of his sunnah. Alright? كُلُّ مَا تَعَلَّقَ بِذَاتِ النَّبِيِّ فَهُوَ سُنَّةٌ Everything that is related to the life, the personality, the existence of the Prophet ﷺ is a part of his sunnah. So the seerah is included, the hadith is also included. But also the word sunnah, and this is a whole other maybe lecture for another day, because this, crea this creates a lot of problems within our communities. But the word sunnah almost depends on the context in which you use it. If you use it technically, almost in the, in the field, in the area, in the arena of theology, if you use the word sunnah, then it's the opposite, the antonym of the word bid'ah. In innovation, the opposite is the word sunnah, a tradition. That's in theological terms. But if you take it over to the area of fiqh, if you use it in the area of fiqh, then it's another category from fard or wajib. Fard and wajib is something you're obligated to do and then you have sunnah. Something that's recommended but not obligated. 
So you see how it took on a completely different meaning? But then if you brought it into a completely different realm, if you talked about it in terms of sources, pure Islamic definitions, then it is what the counterpart or the, the, the companion of the Qur'an. You have Qur'an and Sunnah. Right? Kitabullah wa sunnatu nabihi. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Ar Hajjatul Wida, Book of What do I leave with you? The Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Prophet. So you see three different definitions or three different applications, I should rather say, for the word Sunnah based on the context and how you use it. And that's the reality of the word Sunnah and how to use that word Sunnah. So having said all of that, the point of it was is that Sunnah has a place. And it's more, more overall, sunnah is a terminology and depends on how you use it. But then hadith has a place, has a context, and has a place where it applies. And then you have seerah. And the primary role, the primary function of the seerah, again, like I said before, is to humanize the Prophet ﷺ. To make the common average person feel a sense of connection to the Prophet ﷺ. The third reason, or the third benefit, these are more than anything the benefit of studying the seerah. Why should you study the seerah? What is in it? What, what's in it for me if I study the seerah? The third of it is to extract lessons, like I said this previously. Studying the seerah, the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and it's more, I guess this goes more back to how you approach, how you study the seerah, it allows you to extract lessons. Extract lessons. Make it relevant, practical lessons on uh, uh, what, how it applies to your life. To extract practical, relevant lessons for every demographic of our community, and more importantly, our dilemma, our condition, what we are going through as individuals, as families, and as communities. What can I learn from this? What guidance is provided to me in terms of this? And now this leads me into another side little issue that I wanted to approach here. And that is that this not only relates to how we study the seerah, that we have to study in a way, but also what we take from it. And the lessons that we extract from it that are relevant and that are practical. Because again, going back to the original topic and going back to where we started from, that when we study the life of the Prophet Sallallahu it's, it's, it's a practical guide. It's a practical guide on how to live your life. And, and when we look at our per, our exact predicament and our situation. And this, what I'm going to give you is a little bit of a brief insight onto how seerah has been studied throughout the centuries for the majority of, Islam, of Muslim history, Islamic history. When you look within books of seerah, you'll find that the Meccan era is oftentimes, is presented, in a lot, is presented a lot more briefly than the Medinan period. The Medinan period has been the fascination of Muslim civilization for the last 1400 years. When in reality, let's take it into consideration. Generally speaking, it's rounded off and we're gonna get to that when we get to that, probably much later on, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to get there. But when we get there, we'll get there, but rounded off, how long was the Meccan period of prophethood? I should clarify, how long was the Meccan period of prophethood? 13 years. How long was the Medinan period of prophethood? Ten years. Obviously, you don't need to be a mathematician. A child could tell you the Meccan period was longer than the Medinan period. But it doesn't change the fact that when you look at books of Sirah, the Meccan period will be presented in 50, 60, 100 pages, and the Medinan period will be presented in two to 300 pages in a sample Sirah book. If a Sirah book is about 400 pages, 100 pages, a fourth of it will be the Meccan period, three-fourths of it, 300 pages will be the Medinan period. Alright, that's very interesting. How did that happen? When one is obviously longer than the other. So there's a couple of things to take into consideration. And even though maybe this is better tackled as we go through it, but I think almost as an introduction, and this needs to be presented. Number one is that and I'll be, uh, to be fair to the discussion, to the conversation, I'll put this as point number one. The, the first explanation for this is, there, there is a lot more narrated about the Medinan period than there is about the Meccan period. That's just the cold hard facts. All right, why? Well, there were more Muslims. There were more Sahaba. So obviously. Plus, the life and the practice and the, the message 
of the Prophet ﷺ was a lot more open in the Medinian period than it was in the Meccan period. Meccan period, remember, first three years were super covert, very private. There was no public dawah, there was no public message. There was a private dawah that was going on with between personal networks. All right, just like anything begins, you start on a very, very close with the people that are closest to you. All right, even after that, the Prophet ﷺ would practice and would preach and would teach privately within the house of Arqam. All right, Darul Arqam. It was still something that was very closed, very private, very quiet. There was a lot of oppression during that time. All right, the Medinan period versus that was wide open. I mean, the entire life of the Prophet ﷺ was now on full display. All right, that's why you had the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ where all of the activities took place. And then even the residence of the Prophet ﷺ was right next door. So it was like you had full access to him now. Not only that, but from a certain, from a very surface level perspective, the Medinan period seemed to be a lot more eventful than the Meccan period. Even though the Meccan period had some major, major events. There was a lot going on. But the Medinan period from a very surface look seems to be very eventful. Battle of Badr, Battle of Uhud, Battle of the Trench. All right, you have traveling out to Khaybar and Banu Mustalaq and all of these different areas and regions as far as Tabuk. And then you have Sulh Hudaybiyah, you have Umratul Qada, you have Hajjatul Wida, Fatu Makkah. I mean, it's very, very eventful. All of this is going on. Plus, so, so you have just a lot more narrated about the life of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina versus the life of the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca. Plus the other thing, and this goes back to that distinction between Hadith and Seerah. Hadith has a very different criteria than Seerah does. The level of which muhaddithun critique the hadith because they know that later on after the muhaddithun put the hadith through their filters, it's got to be handed over to the legal experts, the fuqaha. And then the fuqaha will make decisions based on what we hand to them, important decisions like halal and haram. So hadith has a very different criteria by which it is judged than sirah does. Sirah is overall the life. The life events, which do not always have legal implications, which are morals and objectives and lessons, and sometimes not even that. Sometimes it's simply emotional consolation. When you know, when you can simply know the fact that the Prophet ﷺ's son died, and he cried, and he was sad, and he got choked up, and he had trouble talking to people on the day that his son died. You don't even make any type of a halal haram distinction from that, do you? No, that just provides emotional consolation that the Prophet ﷺ lost a family member. The Prophet ﷺ felt pain. The, and when somebody's child dies, they're able to find comfort and solace in the fact that my messenger Muhammad ﷺ felt my pain and he was able to wake up the next day and continue living and I will be able to wake up tomorrow and keep on going. This will not destroy my life. This will not end my life. I can continue. I can wake up tomorrow. I can move on from this. I can recover from this. It's emotional. So that's why the same filters that are in place to critique hadith don't necessarily need to be applied to seerah. And this is the other thing. So number one, you just have a lot more abundance of narrations for Medinan period versus Meccan period. So that's it. That's the fair observation. So obviously, brother, Medinan period is going to be a lot more elaborative than Meccan period is. But number two, we do have a lot about the Meccan period. But the problem occurred when we started crossing these lines together. When we then started judging everything by the criteria of hadith. That even the life and times of the Prophet ﷺ, just his human experiences, we started critiquing them that, oh, we're not getting this through the same type of chain of narrators that we expect the hadith to come through. Now all of a sudden it became a problem. Not understanding that everything has a place, everything has a role to play. That these are very distinct features of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and they needed to be treated as such. So what we ended up doing was we ended up filtering out a lot of the seerah, which ended up being the Meccan period. And what did we do? We deprived ourselves. We deprived ourselves of an entire era of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, which is very very relevant to us and this is where this conversation is coming from we as Muslims 
And, and I know that maybe other people might listen or might benefit from these uh, recordings, but I'm stating this within the context that I am, and the con only context that I know. Being born and raised here, here, exactly here, in the Dallas area, live, having lived my entire life in this area, this is the social context that I know. This is life as I know it. So we as a minority, living amongst a Muslim majority, oftentimes being understood and more recently being very, very misunderstood. That the Makkan period holds a lot of gems, it holds a lot of insight for us. It holds huge insight for us on how to conduct ourselves, on how to thrive, on how to continue, on how to spread, on how to flourish, and how to blossom as a community. The Medinan period was very different than our circumstances or our situations. We're not completely in the Makkan period, I agree. All right, we're not having to hide. If, you, if the people that are just listening, if they could see the masjid that I'm sitting in, we obviously do not have to hide. All right, you can see this masjid from miles away. I actually have seen it from the plane. All right, I was told you could and I've actually seen it. All right, so we're not hiding. So it's not completely the Meccan experience, but it's not completely the Medinan experience either. It's almost like we have to have a full rounded, a full well-rounded appreciation of the life of the Prophet ﷺ to be able to benefit from it truly and be able to make sense of where we're at and what we're going through. So that's the other thing, that the Medinan period is very, very important and that's, the Meccan period is very important, that's where we're going to extract a lot of lessons from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. But then we go to a completely different thing and that is that there's even benefit. And this is something classical scholarship was very attuned to. This is something classical scholars addressed. That we're arguing Makkan versus Medinan, or we're discussing Makkan versus Medinan. But that's 23 years of a, how long of a life? 63 years. So we still have a 40, we have a 40 year period that we're not even talking about. There's even certain things that we can take from there, certain things we can observe from there, certain lessons we can learn from there. And if you want to be very, very strict about it, if you'd rather be very strict about it, at the least what you can take from that first 40 years is it can give you a very good understanding of what were the circumstances and the situations at that time in which the Prophet ﷺ was sent and he was sent to be who he was and live the type of life that he was living. So if nothing else, then that's what we can take from that. So the point of it is, is that when we extract practical lessons and relevant insight from the life of the Prophet ﷺ into the life of the Messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, then what we need to take into consideration is the Meccan period and even the life before prophethood will provide us certain lessons. So the fourth benefit of studying the seerah and the fourth reason of why it's important for us to study the seerah is authenticity of the sunnah. Now I'm going on a, on a completely different tangent. But these almost are addressing different issues we have in our community. You know, the dehumanization of the life of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi where I feel no human connection to him. That's one issue in our community and that is addressed. The solution is within studying the seerah. Alright, when people feel the life of the Prophet is very irrelevant to them. Like how am I supposed to live my life based on guidance taken from the life of a man 1400 years ago in the middle of Arabia? Like how does that apply to me at all? Well, when you study the seerah properly, that answers that question, that solution. The solution is provided. Well, there's a fourth problem in our communities. And that is, and this is a growing problem. This is a very rampant problem. This is also a very contemporary problem. It's a very modern problem. This has been a fringe discussion for the, va for the majority of 1400 years. I would say safely for about 1200 years, the first 1200 years of our history. This was something that was talked about by some people, what was a fringe issue. Mainstream Muslims were never affected by it and were never concerned by it. But over the last 150 to 200 years, this has become front and center in our communities. And this becomes such a problem that even the common average Muslim is talking about this and is concerned about this and the most dangerous thing is confused about this. And that is the authenticity of the sunnah of hadith. What is the role of the Prophet ﷺ within the religion? Is his life, are his words, is his hadith, is his sunnah authoritative or not? Is it true or not even? People have reached that level. That can I believe in it? 
Is it made up or not? Can I trust it? And then, if I can trust it at some level, does it hold any authority or not? And this is a very common issue today in the Muslim community. I'm pretty sure everybody listening or everybody sitting here, even if they haven't had some of those questions, alhamdulillah, or those concerns or confusions, they know somebody who has brought up a confusion or an issue or a question like that. Just today I got an email about this. I literally probably receive emails saying every day might be a stretch, but more than an average of every other day, I get an email about this. In a week, I probably get about four to five emails about this. And that's not including the people who just approach me directly. Anonymously, just from somewhere, I get emails. I get questions online. I've been, I've been tweeted questions about this. That's how common of an issue is. And that's how prevalent it is. Well, where's the solution? What's the answer? Since this issue has come up, Muslim scholarship has decided, has taken the approach of trying to solve this problem, tackle this issue academically, intellectually. We will intellectually prove, academically substantiate the sunnah, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. While that approach is completely valid, and honestly, intellectually and academically, there are no responses, there are no answers to it. Because the system that's been put in place to preserve the life and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, is one of the most elaborative, is one of the most elaborate intellectual systems that are academically rigorous systems that's been put in place throughout the history of mankind, throughout the history of humanity. It is unbelievable. The entire system, the science of asma wa rijal that is in place is unbelievable. So that's number one. Number two, what people in their simple mindedness, what they fail to understand and appreciate is that the Qur'an, yes, it is the book of Allah, the kalam of Allah, and we believe it to be as such. And Allah has guaranteed the protection of the kalam of Allah, yes. But when Allah preserved the protection of the kalam of Allah, part of the kalam of Allah is Allah is telling us, مَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنُهُ Allah in the Qur'an is telling us to follow the Prophet ﷺ. Then that means that would be protected as well. Allah would not have told us to do something that we would be incapable of doing. When Allah said, follow the Messenger, then Allah put a system into place. Allah guaranteed that the practice of the Messenger would be preserved. Alright? That put aside, the real point I wanted to make was this. The Qur'an has been promised, yes. But the Qur'an has also come to us through a system. The Qur'an has come to us through a system. There are riwayat of the Qur'an. There is a chain of transmission even for the Qur'an. How did I know إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ is to be pronounced and read إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ There is a system that it's been passed down. Recited from teacher to student, teacher to student, teacher to student. That system that is in place to preserve the Qur'an is the same system in place to preserve the hadith. The narrators of hadith are the same narrators of the Qur'an. So that's, that's the intellectual academic issue. And like I said, that's a valid answer. But here's the issue and the problem. When you take a look at the issue itself, it's not a purely intellectual or academic issue or problem to begin with. It's primarily a spiritual issue. It's a spiritual problem. What is the spiritual issue and dilemma that's in place? Very easy to understand. All right, we are told to love the Prophet ﷺ. What makes you want to obey the Prophet ﷺ, what makes you want to accept him, what makes you want to study his life and follow him, is your love for him. That's what it boils down to. Well, you can't love the Prophet ﷺ if you don't even know who he is, who he was, how he lived his life, what he did for us. Familiarity, learning about someone leads to familiarity. Familiarizing, with some, familiarizing yourself with someone, becoming familiar with someone then loves to de leads to developing love for that person. All right? it's, it's a natural process of how you, fa how you fall in love with anyone. You kind of get to start to know them, then you become familiar with them, and you fall, before you know it, you're in love with that person. That's, that's how the human heart works. That's the human condition. We became, we as an ummah, two, three hundred years ago, started becoming so unfamiliar. The Prophet ﷺ became so unfamiliar to us. And then eventually got to a point where we even stopped learning about him altogether. All of a sudden, one day as an ummah, we sat there, we stood there and we said, do we really have to listen to this guy? Do we have to do exactly what he says? 
But wasn't he a human being? And how do we know everything that we know about him is true? And how do we know that it, that question arise? And it's a very, it, what, it's almost a natural progression or a, a regression that that occurred. It's not some mystery. Of course that's going to happen. So what's the solution? The solution is learn about him. Become familiar with who he is, who he was, how he lived his life. And see if that doesn't lead you to developing love for him. Because, and I'm not going to preempt the entire series by starting to give you quotations from the life. That's part of the objective. That's what we're going to tackle starting next week. But when you start to learn about him and you start becoming familiar with him, you naturally will start to develop a sense of love for him. You won't be able to help but love this man because of who he was and how he lived his life. And once you begin to love him, you will not have any questions or objections or confusions about it. I actually had a personal interaction with someone. When I say this, I don't just say this like this is some, you know, concoction, this is some theory, some formula I came up in my, within my head. This is an observation of Muslim history and how Muslim scholars have conducted the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. But I even had a personal interaction with, with someone. This was almost like my case study. When I was still a student studying overseas, someone that I knew personally, a community member, very intelligent, very, very intelligent, came from a very, you know, traditional home, grew up knowing about the Qur'an to some extent in the life of the Prophet ﷺ at some level. Later on in his life though, because he was a very intelligent person, very highly educated person, he developed a fondness and wanted, had de developed a zeal to learn the Qur'an, to study the Book of Allah. Started studying the Qur'an and tafsir of the Qur'an and translation of the Qur'an, really started studying the Qur'an. Along the way he came across some individuals, some resources that instilled within his mind skepticism in regards to hadith. And it continued to grow within him to the point where it reached full-blown full -blown confusion. And he had had a few discussions with me that were, you know, almost like debates. What about this? But what about that? But what about this? But what about that? One day, I was visiting for the month of Ramadan, because that's when we used to be off from our studies overseas. So I was visiting for the month of Ramadan. I went to go visit him because I was going to be leaving in a couple of days. And it was somebody I was very close with. He would attend all my lectures that I would give during the month of Ramadan and things like that. So I went to go visit him and say salam to him. So I sat down with him in his office and he said, forget about everything. Just give it to me. Bottom line, is hadith something we're supposed to believe in or not? Do I have to believe in this or not? Because again, it was more confusion than it was like, you know, hatred towards hadith. He was just confused. He didn't know what to believe. So I told him, I, I said, I don't even want you to, I, I don't want to talk to you about that anymore. Just forget about that question. I asked him, SubhanAllah, it just occurred to me at that moment. I asked him, I said, when was the last time you read a book on seerah? When was the last time you read seerah of the Prophet his life? And he's like, gosh, I can't even remember. I don't know. So at least it's been a few years. So I said, okay. I said, I'm going to come see you tomorrow. I'll drop by tomorrow. I went to the bookstores, found whatever one, two books of seerah that I could find. You know, this is before the interwebs. So I found whatever books of seerah, I could find a couple of them. And I came by his office the next day. I dropped them off and I said, this is a gift from me to you. I just want you to make me one promise. You're going to start reading this. I knew he was a very studious person. He was very, you know, when he would start studying, he would study, he would read, he would read a lot. So I told him, just read this. And then I gave him a few more recommendations. I said, you know, if you got some friends in a bigger city or overseas or something like that, if you can get your hands on these couple of more textbooks of Sira, I'd recommend it. I came back about 10 months later for the next Ramadan. 10, 11 months later, I came back. When I got back a few days later, I went to go visit him again. When I went to his office, I saw those couple of books that I had given to him as a gift, plus another three, four books of Sira that he had gotten from somewhere. And when he would study, he would read, he would like, you know, he was one of those real, like, intense studiers, where you could tell from the shape of his book that he'd been reading. He'd tear it up and put notes in it and stick papers in it and all types of things. So I could tell that these books had gone through a bit of a rough patch there. So I asked him, I said, how's this been going? And he's like, 
problem solved. I was like, what do you mean problem? I'm asking how, what are the books? He goes, problem solved. I say, you don't have no more questions about hadith? Are they authentic or not? Do you have to follow them or not? Do you believe in it? No, he's like, no, no questions. He said, I read those two books you gave me three times at least each. Then I ordered three more books of seerah and I read those three times each. This entire year, all I've done is read seerah, like 15 times over. And at the end of it, I reached a conclusion. I, I have so much love for this man, I can't even say it. I don't even know how to put into words how much I love and respect this man. And how much he did for me. And how much his life means to me. And how much I can benefit from his life. This, this same individual, after that moment on, you know typically within the local masjid, within my local masjid, you know, like it happens over here, you know, after Isha, the Imam opens Riyadh al-Salihin or a book of hadith and reads a hadith and translates and briefly explains it. Well, I would do that in my masjid. On the days that I would be traveling or I was sick or I couldn't make it, he was the same guy that would read the hadith on that day. The same guy who a few years ago said, I don't believe in this stuff, this is all phony baloney, I can't believe in it, it's a big lie. I can't trust it. A couple of years later, just by reading the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, his life, he was completely turned around to the point where he was the one who would read the hadith to the rest of the congregation. And that's a huge benefit of studying the seerah, studying the life of the Prophet ﷺ. That it, it, it develops that love for the Prophet ﷺ. I mean, this whole plague that we have in the Ummah right now about skepticism about his life and hadith and its authenticity, the solution to it is the seerah, the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Because you build that connection with the Prophet ﷺ. What time is Salat al-Isha? 9.15. 9.15, okay. Inshallah, I'll just be making a couple of more points and then we'll go ahead and wrap up in just two more minutes, inshallah. Are there needs to be called now? Inshallah, we'll go ahead and stop here for today, inshallah. Um, we've covered about four points, four reasons, four benefits of setting the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Next week, we'll pick up and we'll continue on from here, inshallah. And uh, we'll complete the intro to studying the seerah and then we'll actually, probably next week, actually start at the very beginning uh, by, and the way we'll be doing this is we'll first take a real brief uh, account of what were the times like when the Prophet ﷺ was born. What was the condition of the world at that time? Particularly his society. And then we'll progress on from there forward. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the reality of everything we've said and heard. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us true love of the Prophet ﷺ. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik.